I normally just record to my own, but we'll figure that out. And it's yeah, just it'll... recording to the cloud. Okay. So I am so glad you are all here today. And it is Wednesday, and I've been confused all week. I kept thinking Sunday was Monday and was worried I didn't take out my trash. And then I kept thinking today was Thursday. And I was like, oh, no, I missed sending something to the kids um, for their video. But today is Wednesday. And that is a good thing, I do believe. Um, so I am so glad each of you are here. Um, I'll start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into our study. You are the salt of the earth. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so glad that you are with us this week. Sometimes we don't feel you, but we know you are there. Um, we ask that you reveal yourselves to us in some special way this week so that we can embody what it means to be the salt of the earth. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint for this week and share the screen so we can do that. All right. You should all be able to see this. As a reminder, you may need to move your people um, so that you can see everything that we are reading. This way we can all take part. And we are the salt of the earth. Who would like to start reading for us this week? I can. All right, go for it, Ed. As the sun rose over the horizon that morning, the world began to sparkle. The dew on the grass and the leaves radiated a shining glow. Across the face of the lake, waves broke down in shimmers that seemed to reflect the sun a million times. From every perspective, it was a world made fresh, a world made new once more. The people seated on the grass were astonished at Jesus' words. Once more, he said things they didn't expect things they had never heard before, speaking to them as if they were already citizens of the kingdom of heaven. He gave them not only a path to follow, but a worldview they had never before imagined. You are the salt of the earth, he said, his arms swinging wide as if to invite their gaze. And in the distance, they did see the salt of the earth. They saw salt glistening in the morning sun along every path through the grass and hills. Salt was an integral part of the life in Jesus today. Today we use salt mainly as a seasoning to melt ice or snow or to make homemade ice cream. Sounds good. In those days, salt was used primarily as a preservative, a way to keep food fresh, especially meat. Without refrigerators or freezers, it was difficult to keep food from spoiling quickly. All right, would someone else like to pick up? I can. I can. Okay, go Dave. Salt preserves because it pre permeates and changes what is added to. Christians can work in the same way in society, but they must be a part of it if they are to change it. Through personal contacts and friendships, we can touch people with the gospel of Jesus. We must make friends of those we wish to reach. When they can see in us a love of life, a sense of peace, when difficulties arise, and a confident view of the future, they will want to know what we know and who we know. But like salt, we must mingle with them if we are to change them. Salt available in the Middle East in those days was not the same purified variety we can buy today. It was harvested from swampy land and was usually thoroughly mixed with mud, soil, and organic matter. As it was used to preserve food, it tended to get more dilute with organic matter until finally the mixture didn't have enough saltiness to work as a preservative. 
When that happened, the mixture was thrown out onto pathways. It was mm. salty enough to inhibit the growth of grasses in the pathway, but not salty enough to preserve food anymore. This was the salt the crowd could see shining along the pathways. Each day from then on, when they walked those pathways, they would think how just as salt can lose its savor, a person who loses their passion for the word of God will also be left behind. But they also remembered that they could change the world if they could share the love they saw in Jesus. All right, and so then the verse, of course, is you are the salt of the earth. As I was reading this first part, I, I was also thinking of another use for salt. And it's probably best if it's a salt that um, you're not going to use for seasoning, is it can be an abrasive. Um, when I worked in the radio industry, we would take um, a little bit of warm water, and or actually cold water worked better because it didn't dissolve the salt as well and pour in some salt and stir it around to get the coffee stains off the coffee pots. Um, you can use salt as an abrasive to help clean things. So salt can also be abrasive, which is not necessarily what we want, um, but it can be used as a cleaner as well. So lots of interesting uses for salt. Um, it can be used to disinfect wounds mixed with water, um, things like that. Any comments before we get into the next section, um, the blessings quotes about this passage? All right, let's go on to the next one. So we've only got, uh, I think, two slides on this one. Um, this again is the section from Blessings, which is an easy region, reader version of Thoughts on the Mount of Blessings. And who would like to read this slide for us? I can read that. Go for it, Karen. Okay. Throughout history, salt has been valuable because of its ability to preserve food and keep it from spoiling. When Jesus called his followers salt, he was teaching them that they could change the world around them by sharing their soul-saving message. God chooses people not just to make them a part of his family, but to reach out through them to the rest of the world with the message of salvation. God didn't choose Abraham just to increase his circle of friends. He chose Abraham to be a channel of blessing to the people of the earth. In his last prayer with his disciples before his crucifixion, Jesus said, for their sake, I am making myself ready to serve so that they can be ready for their service of the truth. John 17, 19. As Christians are changed through truth, they will in turn change the world and save it from moral decay. By penetrating food, salt preserves and changes it in the same way, the gospel changes people through personal contact and friendship with God's followers. We must make friends with those we hope to help. They will respond to the gospels as individuals, not in mass groups. The saltiness of salt represents the true power of the Christian, the love of Jesus in the heart, and the righteousness of Jesus in the life. If Jesus' love lives in our hearts, it will flow out to others. As we make friends with people, their hearts will be warmed by the unselfish kindness we show them. All sincere believers radiate a life-enhancing energy that touches and strengthens the people around them, especially those they are trying to reach with the gospel. This power is not ours, but the power of the Holy Spirit that begins to change hearts and minds. All right, and that leads us to our questions. Let me just change this a little bit so I can see more of all of y'all. So why did Jesus call his followers salt? And in what way are Christians like salt? We're supposed to be agents of change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So agents of change, uh, in what way? <laughs> you know, in, there's been times where Christians were agents of change by slaughtering people. You know, <laughs> you think of the Crusades, you're going to be, you're going to change or you're going to die. Um, is that the change agent that uh, God wants for us? Well, it obviously is not the change agent he wants, but it does bring up um, the thought anything when taken to extreme one way or the other defeats the purpose that it was originally set out for. Yeah. Right, because you can have too much salt in something, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then it goes to waste, mm -hmm. or that's almost worse than salt not having its flavor when you add it to something. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a turn off and you throw out or whatever and it and yeah, mm -hmm. turn away from as opposed to drawing towards. And just a reminder, since I'm not set up as the host, I won't see anybody if they raise their hands. So you'll just have to unmute yourself and barge in. Um, but. So what we need to do is live so that the Holy Spirit works in us, just like it said in the closing pages there to prepare people for the change of uh, being ready to go to heaven and right. learning to live in heaven here on this earth. I think it's kind of neat how they talked about the salt, you know, that initially it's, it, it's a lot more concentrated or whatever has, has much more effect. And then as it goes on, it loses that effect, but yet it still has a use too. And um, mm. as we age, <laughs> I, I think that's something to be said too. I used to, um, I had really good friends when I was in my younger years and the guy was in his eighties and, and he was still giving all the time to people, you know, and in the church active and everything. And I said, how do you keep going? He says, well, this is still my family. He says, and I, I still have the ability to influence, he says, and that's, that's important to me. And he said, and I enjoy it. And I just thought, you know, God bless him and how that's a nice mentor and a nice um yeah for character for us to see as younger coming up they're, they're they're showing us how we continue to be helpful and useful with god's grace i wonder if anybody else has noticed uh, in here that uh, jesus called us to mingle with um the people around us to become friends with them but yet growing up as a young man in the Seventh-day Adventist community, there was this idea uh, that Paul seems to put out in some instances, don't associate with them. They're bad people. You, you had the idea of, oh my goodness, don't associate with a Baptist or a Catholic or they're just gonna pollute your life. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Well, well that, that's going to go to our next question as well, um, being friends with those. But go ahead, Ed. Right off the bat, Paul is not supposed to be our example. Jesus is our example. And even the church elders back then got on to him for the people that he hung out with. So uh, I think mm -hmm. Jesus sort of broke the mold. <laughs> I wanted to say the, one of the uses for salt is also for flavoring or seasoning. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Christians, uh, I, I remember a personal experience uh, many years ago. I used to uh, go to a property in Lynn. It's a, it was a very busy place. And I never thought much about you know, anything I did because usually that's the way I am. Uh, but this uh, one day... Uh, this woman, uh, she used to, she was one of the managers, uh, and that day was her last day there. And she had a little uh, um, postcard, a little card for me uh, that she wanted to give me. And um, she said, uh, John, you know, I, I really want to uh, thank you uh, for the uh, many years that you provided service uh, for us. Not for the service, but the way you've done it. And, and uh, I am very appreciative of what you've done. Later, when I got home, I opened up the, uh, the, uh, the card and I was just amazed uh, to what she wrote there. Till this day, I, I'm sure I have it somewhere in some corner. 
but uh, she talked about how I, um, when I walked in, uh, you know, there, there was a calmness and a serenity and a peacefulness uh, because apparently these people were there so stressed out and were talking among themselves and, you know, uh, 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 everybody was talking about each other and it was very, uh, uh, a very bad environment. And she appreciated the fact that when I walked in, I never spoke about anyone badly or that this positive attitude was, uh, it was something that she was just amazed because I guess she was, you know, she wasn't accustomed to that. For us as Christians, it might, it might seem like regular stuff. You know, it's, it's our regular way of living. Uh, but every now and then we'll come across people that we'll see a certain seasoning of our, the way we live our lives, uh, a certain flavor that uh, makes their days better. We, we don't think that they're looking or noticing that uh, too often, but they are. And every now and then you'll get the uh, chance to reap, you know, the benefits that you think no one's looking or no one's listening, but they are. And when you're able to do something like that, you know, the, the Lord uh, is praised. Mm. Mm. Right, and exactly what you said, it's not something to be proud about, um, but it's an acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And if the Holy Spirit can do that in our lives, the Holy Spirit can do that in someone else's lives as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to just follow up on um, actually what John and, and Dennis both said. I mean, I can remember um, growing up, it kind of... It seems to be in the 70s and the 80s, there was a lot of emphasis on, on separating ourselves from others. And I'm not sure we understood how we're supposed to be in the world and not of the world. Um, and then as you become a parent, you, you look at who your kids' friends are and stuff, and there, there is an absolute truth that you look around and you see who your friends are, and that's who you're going to become basically you know as far as your aspirations and things like that there's a lot of truth in that so mm -hmm. as parents you you kind of guard or you set up boundaries i think maybe that's the word i'm looking for you know my kids would have friends whose parents did not have the same uh, values that i did and that's not to say that, that we had perfect values by any means but we did set up boundaries you know there were controls you know in in who they went with or, or how they went with, you know, and, and they didn't do sleepovers or anything with certain people. But I think Christ, you know, he mingled with everybody, but he did have boundaries. And like Ed said, he, you know, he went back to his, who, to his nurturer, you know, to his father every day mm. to reset his gauges and, and to make sure he was following. But it, it is a challenge for us to, to be in and not of the world. I'm reading a book also here and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up here in a minute, but it's about somebody who grew up basically in a very sheltered community in an Adventist community. And, and she talked about growing up that they were extreme, but she said, basically their purpose in life was when they went into, when they did go down and visit Adventist churches, their purpose in life was to go in and tell everybody what they were doing wrong the whole time. And then, as she got older and was able to think for herself a little bit more mm -hmm. and that she understood that that wasn't the purpose that Christ had. And, you know, she was able to find her, um, find the right niche and the right relationship with Christ and understand what that was. But it, it's a very real thing for us to, to want to separate ourselves. This is a statement that I, I read fairly often. A uh, true lovable Christian is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Bible truth. Absolutely. Such a, such a man is Christ's representative. His life is the most convincing evidence that can be born to the power of divine grace. When God's people bring the righteousness of Christ into daily life, sinners will be converted and victories over enemies will be, enemy will be gained. Definitely. And people can't witness our character if we're not friends with them, right? Um. Well, I, I, something that's uh, kind of just struck me was, um, you know, I was just thinking about um, 
about Lot's wife and how that <laughs> applies to, <laughs> to this. Um, the salt. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, you know, and then, I, so I was just went back and I just reread the text just to, um, uh, you know, where, where he's in Matthew 5, he's, you know, you, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its flavor, wherewith shall it be salted? So he's, he's saying you are the salt of the earth that that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. He's just saying that's, that's a characteristic of you and it can be used in a good way, in good ways and bad ways. You can get um, uh, going back to what Dennis was saying. You can get too tied up in um, other people's uh, um, uh, ways of life and, and, um, uh, you know, just like <laughs> with a lot of sweat, you know, she didn't, uh, she didn't want to leave um, that, that, uh, the place that, uh, you know, that the Lord had warned them that they needed to get, get away from, you, you know, she was, um, but uh, yeah, there, there's a, like, like, uh, like you say, there's a, um, uh, if you're constantly uh, recentering yourself, with um, by going back to the source, then uh, you know he he actually allow you know he he makes he balances everything everything out allows us to um, to mingle with others and and uh, and um, all the good good traits of salt uh, shine through as opposed to the bad ones. Hmm. Sometimes when you mingle with those who are different than you, you get a better view of how you are because you're not necessarily looking up in, in your own mirror anymore. And you're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize we did that. Or I didn't realize that wasn't a normal thing. Um, you know, something as simple as in New England, it tends to be on the first of the month you say rabbit, rabbit to someone. I don't know why. We never did this growing up. My friends did it. And I'm like, Okay. <laughs> It's not a bad thing, but there's different things that you don't realize no one else does um, or things that people do that you don't do until you're in those situations where you are getting to know people. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to think about why you do what you do. Um, when you're in a, maybe a family dynamic or you're in a place and you're not challenged for why you do what you do, um, it, you can get sloppy. Um, and it's kind of like putting your salt on the shelf and it just sits there and you, you don't get challenged. And uh, I think that can be a deterrent to really understanding your faith. So when you do get challenged, um, you can stand up. I think one of the fears of why you only had to hang out with certain people in the seventies and eighties, like you were saying, Jill, was because, or in Dennis too, well, if you hang out with a the Baptist, then what if you start going to church on a different day? Or what if you start following this belief? It, because, well, that'll happen if you don't know why you believe what you believe. Um, so you're not grounded. And so rather than do the hard work of getting grounded, we'll just keep out anything that might be different. And I think that's why a lot of my generation has left the church. Mm. Because they didn't have that grounding. So I think, I think, uh, Christy just said that we're a salt shaker and we need to fill a salt shaker up every morning, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. So what does the saltiness of salt represent? And in here, it was saying that the saltiness represents the true power of a Christian, the love of Jesus in the heart, and the righteousness of Jesus in our life. So it's, it's the power that we don't have. It's the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ's righteousness. And uh, if we don't have those, we don't have any power. And well, of ourselves, we don't have any power anyway, period. So then is that saltiness, not the bad being salty, um, but is that saltiness touching someone else's life? Is it benefiting someone? Um, or is it hurting them? Is it salt being rubbed in a wound? And sometimes that needs to be done to make it better. 
Um, sometimes it's just to be snotty. Or is there someone you can think of in your life who has reached out and touched you and has um, been refreshing for you um, when it comes to your relationship with God or how do you see the world? Because ideally, we're not just interacting with people we don't know. We're acting with our friends and um, we can learn a lot from each other as well and share that saltiness. I think we all have known people who have, oh, I don't know, for lack of a better term, who have a higher standard than us. And when you're around them or whatever, you know that if you do something, you the thought crosses your mind that, oh, they wouldn't really approve of that. Or I know that's not, that's not them. So I, we're all on a different spectrum or whatever, but um and we, and we need all of that in our lives. We need people that are, that have moved on past something that gives us trouble um, to show us better. But we also in turn need to be that person who encourages others to strive more too in what we, in what we are doing and saying, like we need to be a drawing factor. Karen, were you gonna say something? Yes, I have a friend. Um, in fact, she's the one who brought me into the church. She, um, and I just have such a double feeling about her because sometimes she just really can explain something or give a new insight in, in some of scripture and be really helpful. And then other times she gets really adamant that what she thinks, you better believe it. <laughs> it's that kind of Right away, I, I want to back off because <laughs> that's, you know, I, I just, I don't like that. But, you know, I know she, I do like her and she's really a lovely person. And, but she does have this attitude sometimes <laughs> that comes through. But she's really helped me a lot, too, in my studies and so on. So. That's Ken. That's when you have to be a good influence to her. <laughs> Well, I would, except she lives out in Nevada now, so I don't get to see her much. All it right. Challenging. And I, for me, sometimes I need to focus on, like you're already saying, like, like the good part that they do and just realize that, you know, they're not perfect and we all can look in the mirror and say the same thing. Well, most of us anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. All right. So we'll go on to this next section. And it, we're still dealing with the same um, salts of the earth. And this section comes from um, the Mount of Blessings. Um, so I can move everything around. Um, oops, went too far. Um, so this is from the book Mount. Oh, there, we uh, there we go. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 36 through 38. Um, I'll read the first one, and again, this is shorter, so it won't be, I think it's only three slides in this one. As they listened to the words of Christ, the people could see the white salt glistening in the pathways where it had been cast out because it had lost its savor and was therefore useless. It well represented the condition of the Pharisees and the effect of their religion upon society. It represents the life of every soul from whom the power of the grace of God has departed and who has become cold and Christless. Whatever may be his profession, such a one is looked upon by men and angels as insipid and disagreeable. It is to such that Christ says, I would thou wert hot or cold. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Revelation 3, 15 to 16. He'd like to read the next slide for me. I can do it. All right. Without a living faith in Christ as personal savior, it is impossible to make our influence felt in a skeptical world. We cannot give to others that which we do not ourselves possess. It is in proportion to our own devotion and consecration to Christ that we exert an influence for the blessing and uplifting of mankind. 
if there is no actual service, no genuine love, no reality of experience, there is no power to help, no connection with heaven, no savor of Christ in the life. Unless the Holy Spirit can use us as agents through whom to communicate to the world the truth as it is in Jesus, we are as salt that has lost its savor and is entirely worthless. By our lack of the grace of Christ, we testify to the world that the truth which we claim to believe has no sanctifying power. And thus, so far as our influence goes, we make of no effect the word of God. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profiteth me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. When love fills the heart, it will flow out to others, not because of favors received from them, but because love is the principle of action. Love modifies the character, governs the impulses, subdues enmity, and ennobles the affections. This love is as broad as the universe and is in harmony with that of the angel workers. Cherished in the heart, it sweetens the entire life and sheds its blessing upon all around. It is this, and this only, that can make us the salt of the earth. All right. Love. It's easy to say we love someone, but sometimes it can be very hard to love someone. Um, can I Why? say something? Oh, yes, you may. Go for it. Thanks. Uh, what she just read just mm -hmm. speaks, I mean, it's so insightful and it speaks such volumes because there are times, and we saw this with the disciples, even during Christ's lifetime, when they were just tired, Peter denying him and so on. And there are times when I'm just, I'm empty. You know, I am grieving, I'm empty, whatever. But I, you can show it by your love and your actions. And I, I wonder about people that just come, and we talked about this earlier, just come blasting at you with their views of salvation and what you need to be doing. And I just dig my heels in or turn my back or whatever. But the love, but when, when I see love, I'm much more interested. And they don't have to be preaching. They can just show love. And then I want to know what motivates them. Does that love, make sense? It does. I love the quote from Francis of Assisi, you know, preach the Absolutely. gospel wherever you are. And if you have to, then use words. If you must, then use words. Uh -huh. I love that too. I like that, the sentence too, that talked about the love as broad as the universe and is in harmony with that of the angel workers. That is so cool. Yeah, it reminds us we're not in this work alone, right? Mm -hmm. Oh. So for our questions, and this is the last slide that we have today. Um, why was salt thrown to the pathways in Jesus's day? And how does that illustrate Christians who have lost their connection to God? It, it wasn't any use. It, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't good for anything, so they, they threw it out. And uh, it did maybe keep the weeds out, but uh, it, really, so it could, that's it could still use. kill. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it just it's um, it just wasn't good for anything. It was uh, kind of useless. It, it had potential, but uh, either it either got it got old and stale, or um, I don't know if salt goes bad or not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. you, you buy a salt shaker and you know a tub of it. You know, you don't use it for probably years, and but uh, maybe it does kind of lose its flavor over time. I don't know, but uh, it, this lost its it lost its usefulness. It, it it couldn't it couldn't enhance or a flavor or um, preserve. preserve 
preserve, it couldn't preserve, it couldn't enhance, it couldn't uh, brighten up. Uh, it, it was just, it had to be just thrown out. So how does that illustrate, or how can we use that to explain Christians who have lost their connection to God? What's the connection between? Maybe it's, maybe that salt that's no good, it's, it's Christians in name only, you know? They, they don't have a connect, they call themselves Christians, but, uh, but they don't have any connection with God. And it's kind of a, I think it's illustrative of the idea about the salt that's just, just thrown out onto the pathway. Um, now, if you look at salt, do you know if it has its saltiness or not? Can you tell just no. by looking at it? No. Well, no. They, they could tell because it had a lot of other junk in it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, extraneous matter, it said. But, uh, but you can't tell, no, you really can't. And sometimes you can't tell if someone's lost their connection. No. If they're putting on a really good show. Oh, we all, we're great at that. Mm -hmm. But another way to look at it is if it, it once was salt, whether it's lost its saltiness or not, it once was salt. And if I, in my better days, was hungry for the word of God, living for God, in my worst days, He's hanging on to me. I still have that origin of a believer, just like salt had the origin of being salt. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, and I think, too, that's where the illustration breaks down, because salt can't regain its saltiness. But Christians who've lost their connection to God can regain that connection. Mm -hmm. Amen. So that's where it breaks down there. So we do have the ability and let, let's rephrase that. The Holy Spirit can work in us. Mm -hmm. It's not our ability. Um, we have the ability to cry out and say, I, lost, I don't know where along the way I lost my connection. Um, sometimes it's gradual. Sometimes it's very, you can tell the point um, in your life. So there is a way, though, to get back. And... So what are we telling the world when we claim to be Christians, but we show no faith <laughs> or no love for others or, or, it, or it becomes kind of like that family that Jill was talking about in the story. It's my job as a Christian to tell you how wrong you are because I want to be right. Not because I know who you are and I care about you and I want what you to live a fulfilling life. I just want to be right. What does that tell the world? Uh, you, lo you lose the ability to influence mm -hmm. and to draw. But, you know, I was thinking, too, before we go to this point a little bit, that um, the salt, they throw it out, and it still works. You know, it still cuts <laughs> on some of the weeds and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. when they tossed it out or whatever because they, they would toss it on the walkways but it kind of reminds me of you know Christ said at the end there's going to be people that say you know I did this and this and this and he's going to say I knew you not so I mean even till the end I mean there's going to be people that look like they are Christians mm -hmm. for all purposes mm -hmm. and, he, um, and he said to let the wheat grow with the tares too so and there might even be people who believe they are Christians. Absolutely. Yes. Um, but don't have that heart change. I was thinking there's one word, hypocrite. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, people, thank you. I was going to say. I, if people oh, see I, that, a wolf and she's that's going to discourage better, them yeah. from Do trying better. to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm glad there's no hypocrites in our church. No. <laughs> Well, and here's a, a little Greek lesson for you. Um, you know, we think of hypocrite as someone, um, you know, very bad who is trying to, you know, doesn't live out their values, that sort of thing. But it comes from the Greek word for actor. Um, it wasn't necessarily negatively charged the way it is now, um, but an actor. I had a principal when I was in grade school that told us our, our class something that I guess for some reason I never forgot I'm not sure why but he says in his opinion there was only one person worse than a hypocrite 
and that somebody who hides behind the hypocrite. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, true. So while we may not be perfect, and at times we all are putting on shows because we don't all wake up bright and cheery and happy and say la-di-da-di-da, um, <laughs> but we still can love and we can still work in our faith. Um, and when we fail, we don't have to wait for the next day to get that recharge, right? We can go to that salt shaker and fill it at any point, right? Right. Basically, being a Christian, it's going to boil down to, it boils down to compassion for me and, and how you treat others. Mm -hmm. That's where it shows. So I'm going to share, I did a recording for the third and fourth graders today and they were talking about kindness. So I dug out my shirt. Um, that's be kind. Mm -hmm. And it's sad sometimes that we have to remind ourselves, but sometimes we do have to remind ourselves to be kind, especially those people who know just the right button to push. Well, or yeah, it's people that are not kind to us. Right. And, and no matter how nice you want to be, sometimes it's just, I've had enough. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, there's some people, no fault of their own, they just found our last nerve. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, Ed, I could get in line and take a number for a lot of people, so. <laughs> so what does it show the world, though, when they see unloving Christians? I think of... Um, Gandhi, who says, I like your Christ, but your Christians, not so much. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's why, why um, well, <laughs> not to get too deep, too deep into we things. We got time. But, <laughs> but if, um, no, I think, uh, I think that us being Christians and accurately representing who God is, is, is um, the most important thing for us. Because if we're not representing what his true character is, which is that of love, then um, basically we're representing the enemy. Amen. So, you know, so that, that I mean, it, it really is that clear cut, you know, and, um, and if you're doing that in the name of your creator, if you're misrepresenting him, you can see why that's such a serious issue because you're, you're confusing people. You're, you're making people think that, that the, you know, that, that their, their, spo that their, their creator is, um, has all the characteristics of, of what our, our enemy has. And that's, um, Mm -hmm. uh, uh you know that that's why that's but you know and that's also uh when you, you flip it over and you say you you start to see how powerful um a thing like love can be as well because it just uh, it can just completely erase all that in an instant with mm -hmm. someone uh when they see um when they, they when they see the other side of it mm -hmm. To today's to... point, uh, if, uh, if you have the opportunity, look up a song by Wayne Watson called Would I Know You Now? Mm. Uh, it speaks to the exact points that, uh, that Dave was talking about. Mm. When, when Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and the, the well-respected um, elites in his day, they had... Uh, he told them when they converted someone, one of the Gentiles to the Jewish faith, that their view of God and their teaching of God, it, was, it would be better off if those, those Gentiles didn't become Jews. He said, you make, them, you make them too full worse than they were before. Mm -hmm. And I think when we, don't, when we don't live as Christ lived, then we're a, just a terrible advertisement of the gospel. And I think we can remember back in the 80s, some of these tele, televangelists that came <laughs> along and, and had 
and taken these vast amounts of money, but certainly weren't li living like the man from Galilee. They had air-conditioned dog houses and yeah, and uh, luxuries and cars and homes and all these yeah. things. And yeah. I think it just it just in fact it so infuriated the authorities that I remember when one, a couple of them were taken in jail. They were taken in chains and shackles. I mean, it was just. It, there was so much damage done, and, and there is damage done when we don't, when we don't, show the love of Christ. And it's a, uh, if you, if you haven't, my mother always used to say, if you haven't got anything good to say, don't say it. And mm -hmm. uh, at least, at least don't say it and confirm all doubt. You know, it's just kind of like we mm -hmm. need to. We have a powerful witness, one way or the other, and um, you know, and just a very solemn thing to think about. I know there are there's a trend of um, especially if you get your millennials and some of those coming up they don't want to be identified as Christian mm -hmm. um, because of everything that is looped into that term and they're like I'm a follower of Christ I'm a believer but don't loop me in with those hypocrites mm -hmm. um, so yeah I'd argue. Uh I want to know what kind of organization they found without hypocrites. I want to be part of that too. Yeah. So our last question, or Jill, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think it's important. You know, we are supposed to represent Christ and, and be drawing to others as opposed to pushing them away. But amongst ourselves too, we need to realize we need to give each other grace because we are not perfect. It's, it's, it's really an oxymoron kind of that we're supposed to draw all people. When I say we, that we're, we're, spo we're supposed to draw people, but yet we, we are very fallible and it, and it shows up <laughs> time and time again. Um, so it's kind of an oxymoron, but we also need to remember, you know, you need to look at people and sometimes you don't understand things, but you need to look at the whole picture of their life and the, and the influence in general, a lot of times, as opposed to, you know, you could pick through things in Christ's life or things in the Bible and say, oh, this, you know, God was horrible, you know, and he's not a loving God, but you have to look at the whole picture also. And sometimes we get very um, tunnel vision on things. And I think we need to remember there is grace and, um, we have God to guide us and to discern for us, you know, the Holy Spirit, that's what he gives us. But we need to be careful to not put people too high up on a pedestal. And then when they fall a little bit, think, oh, we need to wash them out or whatever. We all have moments. Yeah. Yeah. We want, we want to, um, to lift uh, God's character. We want to show who he is and, and, uh, and and not and and take the focus away from who we are, <laughs> because uh, we, because we're you know we we all are um, like you say we we all have we're challenged uh, yeah <laughs> hopefully that keeps us humble <laughs> well exactly it's it's hard to fall when you're on your knees though that's my mm -hmm. it's one of my mantras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is the only thing that makes us the salt of the earth? If that is put to the love of God, what's the only thing that can make us? Relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say hanging out with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how is that evident in our, how can that be evidenced in our world today? Do we see that um, in our churches, in our daily lives, in our families? What does that look like? I don't think we see it enough. Um, then that's just my feeling. I don't think we see it enough. I think um, we've hit on this all night long. Um, actions speak louder than words. And who was Christ? Although he was king and he was the son of God and, you know, divine and holy, he still was... Um, very humble. He washed his disciples' feet. I don't know how much the Adventists deal with that, but it's out of John mm -hmm. fifteen five, and I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to remember that uh, 
once a quarter as part of our communion, a reminder. Oh, um, do you? Okay, I mm -hmm. didn't know that. Yeah. Um, well, at least humble. you don't believe that you're, at least you don't believe you're eating Jesus's body and drinking his actual blood, do no. you? No. Good. No. <laughs> You know, no, uh, it's a sacrament, or it's a, it's not anything that brings us salvation. It's symbolic. Um, okay, good. Yeah. So that's well, something I, we have. As I think about the question, uh, I'm really glad that, that we got to that question, that that question is there, because it, it gives a little bit uh, more insight as to about the i'm thinking about the properties of the of the salt there there's really nothing innate in the salt that makes it uh, either good or bad when we compare that uh, to the uh, to the christian life for example I, i'm thinking that uh how what makes the salt salty or 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 makes it seasonable something that we can use for the right purpose rather than for the wrong purpose because i guess throughout the reading tonight there's a good type of assault and there's a bad salt, but they're both salt, like David mm -hmm. was pointing out earlier. But I guess when we see this question, the, salt the, the saltiness or the, season, the, the good qualities of the salt are, come from somewhere else. And as we think about the Christian life, as Ed stated, and he likes to remind us quite often, it is all about Jesus and being connected to that source of saltiness or the, those good, you know, elements, the good, the, 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 the cool properties that do the good things that the good salt is supposed to be doing. So it, it really, uh, you know, it's, it's really about having that connection. Now, regarding the second question, you know, I remember, I really have to think back and, and I remember that, I remember, you know, as Jill commented, for example, in the 70s and 80s, uh, that's the, the kind of, you know, those decades I, I was growing up and I recall, you know, that uh, every other preacher had to, you know, put down his, all, his congregation and how big of a sinners we were and like we were, you know, they were called Isaiah, you're the... But, um, and obviously we are, you know, we need of Jesus more and more each day. And the more we look towards Jesus, the more we see ourselves as sinners and and not being inadequate. But there, there's also at a corporate level, as, a, as we look around the things that the church is doing throughout the world, I mean, it's an awesome you know, job that the, that the work does, that the church does. At a local level, we look around our brothers and sisters, how they work tirelessly, you know, day in and day out, week after week, year after year. Can we do more? Most likely, yes. Can we connect better? And there's a lot, you know, there's so much work out there that needs to be done. Yes. But, uh, you know, I don't think we need to either put ourselves in the bottom of the pit. You know, I think, I guess the, the big thing is allowing Jesus to give us the vision if we have a, a small one, but everyone can do something and has got an opportunity to shine and, and flavor and, and season others, you know, with these cool properties that the salt has got as long as we connect, uh, you know, more and more uh, with Jesus every day. Yeah, I just wanted to share, too, a thing. How is it shown in the church on the local level? Um, it, it is shown in the local level. You know, we, we've got something like Pathfinders and Adventures that we put value in and putting our kids in, in Christian situations and surroundings that teach values all the time. Um, you know, even things as simple as potluck or something, I think we, we sense the importance of, of getting together in a, in a, in a setting where we're able to talk and to share and, and to just to get to know people better. So we can moving forward, we can understand other people and um, get to know other people that otherwise we just see, you know, for an hour or two in church. But yet if we 
if we meet other people in different events that we have going on, you have the ability to understand people's talents and um, how they can be helpful and how you can help also. So I think on a local level, we do try. Sometimes it's very feeble, but we do try and, and it, there's good. In, there's also the good in, in our, our Christian school system. It definitely has a purpose, definitely. Yeah, so to be the salt, it doesn't mean you have to run a food bank. Um, oh. it, it doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, a pastor or a counselor. You can be salt, you know, working in a power plant. You can be salt, um, all those nurses and doctors working right now um, who have been helpful teachers in any place where God puts you, you can be salt. And you can share that love. Any other final comments? Well, you can be salt and give traction. Mm -hmm. like, no, that's <laughs> you can keep. You can keep. I use kitty litter for that. But, you can, yeah. <laughs> Melt the ice. You, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Keep things from freezing. Make ice cream. <laughs> right. So there's all different ways. Um, and God has given us each our own way, and it might not look like anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you may be, one person may be making ice cream, and the other person is making beef jerky. So, <laughs> definitely for all of them. Um, all right, I'm uh, going to, I took back the recording, Dennis, I found a way to get back to host. Um, I'm going to stop us here so then we can do our um, prayer requests offline so they don't need to be recorded. Um, but just I'm so glad you are here with us. Oh, we're going to do that.